When the Russian army invaded Ukraine in late February of 2022, many assumed that the young nation's days were numbered. Yet over a year later, the Ukrainian military still seems far from defeated, and the outcome of the conflict still hangs in the balance. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we're taking a closer look at the making of the modern Ukrainian military, the fighting force that has surprised both friend and foe alike. As the Soviet Union buckled under its own weight in 1991, Ukraine emerged as one of several newly independent nations from Eastern Europe. With collapse came inheritance, as Kyiv suddenly found itself in possession of a large chunk of the former Soviet military. This force included various armies, approximately 6,500 tanks, over 7,000 armored vehicles, a significant air force of around 1,500 combat aircraft, and a naval presence in the form of over 95 vessels of all sizes. With 780,000 personnel, the armed forces of Ukraine were among the largest militaries on the continent. However, sustaining a fighting force of that size would prove highly costly and impractical at a time where a major European conflict seemed out of the question. As such, the Ukrainian government opted to significantly reduce the size of its military. Over 100,000 soldiers were discharged in the wake of budget cuts. Part of the funds freed up from these reforms were instead diverted to the development of a national arms industry. Making a profit off of weapons of war was deemed more lucrative than sustaining an unnecessarily large fighting force. Competitively priced Ukrainian manufactured tanks, APCs, and aircraft soon made their way onto the international market. By 2003, the military reforms were officially completed. The size of the armed forces had shrunk to about 295,000 personnel. In 2010, this number would further be reduced to around 200,000, and would subsequently drop as low as 130,000 when conscription was ended in October of 2013. On the geopolitical front, the new government in Kyiv was among the first of former Soviet bloc nations to begin fostering closer relations with the NATO military alliance. In 1995, NATO aided Ukraine during the Kharkiv drinking water disaster, and two years later, the NATO-Ukraine Commission was established. By 2004, relations had progressed to the point that Kyiv approved policies aimed toward deepening its ties with NATO through political and economic reforms, establishing a commission for cooperation with the alliance, and opening the door to joint military exercises. President Viktor Yushchenko, who led the country from 2005 to 2010, became the face of pro-Western alignment and made it his official policy to push Ukraine toward total independence from Russia, while actively seeking to have his country join NATO. During the 2008 Bucharest summit, NATO declared Ukraine's permission for NATO membership, welcoming them to join whenever they wanted so long as they met the criteria for accession, outlined in Article 10 of the North Atlantic Treaty. Given Ukraine's tender position, the requirements were considerable. Not only would Ukraine have to secure political and public support for NATO, they would also have to commit national resources to defense spending, regional cooperation, and arms compatibility with other NATO members. This latter requirement would be especially difficult given that the majority of Ukraine's military stockpile was Soviet surplus. While Yushchenko pushed on, the government remained traditionally divided on the issue of joining NATO. Due to its economic dependence with Russia, militarily, Kyiv maintained close relations with Russia until the fateful events of 2014. After Russian-backed separatist forces in the Donbass region rose up in rebellion and Russian troops moved to annex the Crimean Peninsula, the Ukrainian military began a period of expansion that has continued up to the present day. Although the fighting up to 2022 was contained to the two separatist regions and officially only involved Ukrainian and separatist forces, Moscow's influence in the area was overt, and the government in Kyiv continued to fear an eventual full-scale Russian invasion. 
Investments into the depleted armed forces grew exponentially, and by July 2022, close to half a year after the Russian invasion, then-Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexander Resnikov stated that the armed forces now number over 700,000 personnel, amounting to two armored and 13 mechanized brigades, two mountain brigades, seven rocket and artillery brigades, as well as 225 aircraft. To sustain and further develop this fighting force, Ukraine's defense budget has skyrocketed to $8.3 billion in 2022, a number which is projected to increase even further this year. The spectacular increase in defense spending has resulted in a similarly impressive influx of new weaponry and equipment of all types. However, with fighting in the country ongoing, it is difficult to accurately determine the quantities of operational equipment in use. Equipment and vehicle types that have made their way to the front are in constant flux due to the haphazard arrival of armament deliveries from pro-Western and NATO countries, ranging from a wide variety of small arms to several artillery systems and even tanks. Before we continue, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Raycon. When I'm not using my Raycon earbuds during calls with my production team, you'll find me enjoying their great sound and comfortable fit while streaming my favorite movies and shows, listening to my favorite podcasts and music, and playing my favorite games. Raycon's wireless earbuds start at half the price of other premium audio brands, and they offer 8 hours of playtime, 32 hours of battery life, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a more compact design for a comfortable noise isolating fit. Earbud tap functions also allow you to toggle between three customizable sound profiles, noise isolation and awareness mode, and they come in a range of fun colors and patterns, with a variety of fit options and no dangling wires or stems. Raycons are so reliable that celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, and Mike Tyson can be counted among their loyal users. Raycon has a 30-day free return policy, so support our channel today and click the link in the description box or go to buy Raycon dot com slash armchair historian to get 15% off of your Raycon purchase. Before the large-scale arrival of Western equipment, the standard gear of the Ukrainian army mostly consisted of a selection of weapons from its own arms industry. Besides its stockpile of AK-type assault rifles and light machine guns from the Soviet era, the Ukrainian army has relied on the Tar-21, or Fort 221, bullpup assault rifle as its service weapon of choice. Although initially only utilized by special forces and the Ukrainian security service, the rifle has since made its way to regular divisions as well. To bolster its long-range capabilities, Ukrainian infantry have relied on the VPR-308 sniper rifle, which, with its light frame and increased effective range, has been an upgrade from the older and much more cumbersome Soviet SVD rifle. In terms of explosive firepower, Ukrainian soldiers are equipped with the homemade UAG-40 automatic grenade launcher. Its high level of portability and ease of use make it a desirable weapon in both open ground and urban settings. Finally, for its anti-tank capabilities, Ukrainian ground units use the Stugna P anti-tank missile system. Fired from T-55 tanks and the MT-12 field gun, the Stugna's laser-guided system can hit moving targets with a range of up to 5 kilometers and penetrate armor with up to 800 millimeters in thickness. The Ukrainian military command has also invested much into the army's artillery capabilities, including artillery locating radars, battery command, and control systems. To enhance the efficiency of its artillery corps, Ukrainian command has put special emphasis on the training and formation of new drone forward observation and fire coordination units. The Turkish-made Bayraktar TB2 armed drone has become such a crucial component of the Ukrainian armed forces that there are plans underway to establish local production of these drones in the vicinity of Kyiv. In addition to Ukrainian-made weaponry, the armed forces continue to be amply supplied with both American-made Javelin anti-tank missile systems as well as British-made NLAW rocket launchers. The American Security Assistance Program alone has amounted to $2.7 billion worth of weapons and equipment between 2014 and early 2022. The Ukrainian Air Force, for its part, has given priority to upgrading the nation's large existing air defense network, with its wide array of Soviet-era air defense systems. 
The Navy, similarly, has primarily focused on purchasing small-sized vessels in accordance with its aptly named Mosquito Doctrine, which envisions rapid hit-and-run attacks against the larger Russian Navy with agile patrol boats equipped with guided missiles as well as unmanned kamikaze drones. The nature of service and conscription within the military has also undergone many changes. Under the Soviet Union, all able-bodied males were required to serve two years in the armed forces or three years in the Navy. Mandatory conscription was stopped briefly in October 2013, with the armed forces being made up of 40% conscripts and 60% contract soldiers. However, less than one year later, acting President Alexander Turchinov reinstated conscription in May of 2014, with a modified target of males between the ages of 20 to 27 over the previous 18 to 25. In 2017, over 14,000 individuals enlisted in the Ukrainian Armed Forces for contract service. However, draft evasion had been an ongoing issue since its re-implementation in 2014. By 2022, President Volodymyr Zelensky announced the end of conscription by January 1, 2024, along with an increase in professional servicemen and improved compensation and housing. However, the Russian invasion disrupted these plans, and popular mobilization occurred, including the recruitment of prisoners with combat experience. After the start of the war in the Donbass region in 2014, Kyiv set to identify key weak points within its armed forces. The review found that rampant corruption, poor logistics and medical care, inefficient command, and overall inability to combat cyber attacks all contributed to poor combat performance on the battlefield. To remedy these shortcomings, then-President Petro Proshenko directed sweeping reforms in all these areas. Amongst these changes was a vital initiative to radically change the culture surrounding lower-level command structure, which had previously insisted that lower-level leaders wait for approval from higher headquarters for every desired move. Now the idea was that leaders on the ground would be encouraged to take initiative wherever applicable. Due to fears of a looming Russian invasion, Poroshenko's reforms were given absolute priority and set to be completed in just four years. By the time the Russian forces moved into Ukraine's territory in 2022, the Ukrainian armed forces would prove a far more formidable foe than the one Russian troops had met eight years prior. On February 24th, 2022, Ukraine's worst fears were confirmed, as Russian forces crossed into Ukraine across multiple fronts targeting key centers, such as Odessa, Kharkiv, and Kyiv. However, Russia's plan for a swift victory had been thwarted as the newly reformed Ukrainian armed forces were able to withstand the initial invasion despite their tenuous position. The defense of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, was vital in denying Russia one of their most important strategic objectives, while the displays of tenacity, such as that in Mariupol, showed the extremes to which many Ukrainian volunteers were willing to go. Since 2014, a key component of the Ukrainian defensive strategy has been the construction of trench lines, which have helped consolidate and hold territory under their control. Since 2022, this strategy has remained, with major trench lines becoming key factors toward the static war that has since developed ever since the Russian advance began to slow down. Even as recently as the Battle of Bakhmut, Ukrainian soldiers are hunkered down, waiting for the attrition of their enemies to blunt any further offensives that may occur later down the line. Within a span of just 30 years, the Ukrainian military has transformed itself from a bloated relic of its Soviet past into a modern fighting force, seemingly capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe against one of the strongest militaries in the world. Its rekindling of ties to NATO and the West has arguably contributed much to this process over the years. But unlike several other Western-backed militaries around the world, the Ukrainian armed forces have thus far surpassed all expectations and have managed to hold their own in what they believe to be a fight for their country's very existence.